Welcome to Aircrew Interview. I'm Mike King, your host. In this interview, we chat with writer and general aviation pilot, Dennis Baldry. In this episode, Dennis chats about how he got his start in writing, working for Osprey, his new novel, Blue Diver, and I was also very lucky enough to get a trip in the beautiful Chipmunk. If you enjoy our videos and podcasts and would like to support the channel, you can do this by donating monthly at patreon.com forward slash aircrew interview, where we have four different tiers for you to choose from. This greatly helps us to continue putting out regular quality content. Thank you and enjoy. So Dennis, when did you first become interested in aviation? That is a very, very good question. Um, when I was a, a boy, I was obsessed with motor racing. And I would draw uh, pictures of racing cars. I had racing car wallpaper on my bedroom. <laughs> Um, and then about, it would be in the 60s, uh, mid 60s, it may not have been the absolute, absolute first Biggin Hill International Airfare, uh, but it was certainly one of them and it was televised by the BBC in good old black and white. And I remember seeing the red arrows and uh, my mum then noticed a transitionary phase where I was still driving, it's still uh, driving, I, I wish. I was still drawing uh, racing cars, but then I started to draw aeroplanes and I carried on drawing aeroplanes. And certainly by the time of the moon landings, which are obviously quite topical, uh, in 69, uh, I'd be 11 years old then, uh, at uh, junior school still, I was obsessed with aeroplanes. And I read every aviation book. Uh, I lived in Dromfield then, I went up to the uh, uh, main Dronfield Library and I took out every book that I could on uh, aviation and in fact I began to worry my mum somewhat because the first book I brought back was Rocket Fighter by Mano Ziegler, still one of my absolute favourite books about flying the Messerschmitt ME163 and at the risk of, risk of fast forwarding, never in my wildest imagination did I ever think that I'd uh, uh, end up talking to Winkle Brown Wow. about flying the ME163. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Then I brought back um, The First and the Last by Adolf Galland, who again, I had no idea I would actually end up meeting Adolf Galland one day and having a nice chat to him about the Meteor and the ME262. And then I brought back uh, I Flew for the Führer by Heinz Knoke. I never actually met him. Now by this time my mum was getting a bit worried and she said, uh, I want you to promise me that the next book you bring back from the library isn't about a German. <laughs> so I brought back Wing Leader by Johnny Johnson. That made mum very pleased. So, um, so yeah, so I, I became inculcated with uh, mostly military airplanes, though I love civil airplanes too, and military flying and obviously being a fighter pilot. That was the thing. That was all I ever wanted to be, a fighter pilot, to be on a squadron. That was my dream. Mm -hmm. So. That's how I got into uh, aviation. Mm -hmm. You say you loved aeroplanes, but why didn't you go for the RAF? Or you did, and what happened? Uh, a medical disaster. Oh, no. uh, they found that I was short-sighted. I think I was also seriously mentally challenged as well. I don't think I'd, <laughs> I, my brains would have been fried, fried flying a fast jet. Um, uh, but I, I, I was short-sighted, and uh, they said I was colorblind as well. And of course, the bottom fell out of my world. Mm. Uh, I was not a happy chap at all and I was kind of in a, in a zombie-like state wondering what I was, was now going to do with, uh, with my life and uh, in fact um, uh, my dad uh, uh, and my mum sort of said well you can't just sit there and mope you've got to do something so I um, I applied for um, Derbyshire Police and a, a passed. Uh, I went to be measured for my uniform, that beautiful old-fashioned uniform, uh, at Ripley. And while all this is going on, I'd been encouraged to apply for uh, a defence writer's job at Flight International. And I did. And at the time, we didn't have a phone in the house. It's one of the first things I did when I actually got a proper job as it were. Um, we didn't have a phone so I had to go to the phone box at the end of the road and I did my telephone interview with Doug Richardson 
and it had asked me various questions, some of which I can remember very clearly, like, um, what can you name all the different versions of the Vigan? And uh, what was that British project that was cancelled that had a ventral intake, a bit like an F-16? Of course, I instantly answered P-1121. So on the strength of that, you know, telegrams are arriving. We never had a telegram in the house. <laughs> telegrams are arriving. Come down. So I uh, went to uh, uh, Chesterfield train station, got the train to London, failed the interview. Oh, no. <laughs> failed the interview then they said well come back you know have another go at have a go at something else so I went to become uh, I went for the air transport writers job failed that uh, pretty comprehensively but the, but the absolute Lulu was when they asked me to come back and do the layout sub editor test I, I, if they'd filmed it it would be a, a massive hit on YouTube <laughs> because that was incredibly bad I can't tell you how bad it was. It was awful. So I kind of got philosophical on the train back to Chesterfield. I'm thinking, well, I've met my heroes because I was an avid flight reader. And like everyone else, I always went to Uncle Roger to straighten level straight away. Um, I thought, well, I've, at least I've met the team. At least I've been to Dorset House. Uh, I've had a taste of it. Uh, but now we've got to think about, you know, pounding the beat or whatever. And then I got a letter from Mike Ramsden, JMR as we called him, and I went to his send-off uh, just last week. He died on the 28th of July, aged 90. Um, what a wonderful man and what a kind man. Brilliant writer, uh, brilliant editor, the best editor that Flight ever had, of course I would say that, wouldn't I? Uh, but he was. And, um, and he wrote me this lovely letter uh, it kind of starts, you know, you have failed, blah, blah, blah. But then it said, I'm much impressed with your personal qualities and therefore I'm going to offer you the job of keeper of records, which was kind of a job that I think had existed in the past, but they didn't really need a keeper of records. But it just shows you how kind and generous Mike was that he plucked this nobody from uh, Derbyshire and put him into the office at flight and of course they are inevitably some of the happiest days of my life and I'd, I'd hardly started when Mark Lambert one of the poignant things of course here is that half the people I knew when I worked at flight are, are no longer here mm. including lovely guy Mark Lambert and he's at that time uh, before the accountants spotted it flight had a Seneca one and uh, uh, based at Staple for Tawney. And uh, Mark said, uh, come and have a, you know, let's, do a, let's have a trip. And he was doing uh, ILS approaches into a virtually deserted Stansted. This is in 1978, 79. And, um, and that's what we did. But he also gave me the airplane to fly as well. And afterwards he said, you know, you really ought to get yourself a license, Dennis. But in my head, I'm this, you know, it was always squadron, fast jet, fighter pilot. I don't want to, I'm not interested. So it all kind of washed over me. Um, and uh, that's uh, how I got to, uh, got, got my job at flight. And, it, and, um, and I, I, I kept in touch with JMR, with Mike. Um, and uh, he was thrilled when I soloed the Tiger Moth. He was thrilled when I soloed the Chipmunk. Because he's obviously being very much de Havilland Technical School. De Havilland was a theme that ran through everything and the magazine and everything he did um yes he helped to build the world's first jet airliner i could talk for hours about uh mike and about flight uh, but that gave me an opportunity he gave me an opportunity um that i probably didn't deserve to be honest uh but i embraced it mm -hmm. very interesting stuff but uh Let's move on, because you worked for Osprey for a while, didn't you? And can you uh, name some of the titles you have worked Well, this is an interesting story as well. I, I, I've been moonlighting at flight. And uh, I had made a decision that I was not going to leave flight while ever Mike was editor, because loyalty is very important to me. And I thought it would be very disloyal of me to leave while Mike was still in the editor's chair. It just so happened that for various reasons, he moved upstairs to become editor-in-chief. And at that point, 
um, because of that moonlighting I'd done writing under not under my own name, uh, but just writing little bits and pieces about aviation for other people. Um, I got an interview at the motor show at Earl's Court. Tim Parker came from Osprey, which is part, uh, was then part of George Philip and Sons, the famous cartographers in Long Acre, uh, Covent, Covent Garden, London. And um, he said, we need somebody to start a new aviation list. We've got nothing. We, we've had a bad experience in the past with someone else we brought in. And we've, uh, but now we think it's time to start a new list. Would you be interested? Now, when you're asked a question like that, and the person that's propelled you into this position has now vacated the editor's chair, I could only answer yes. So that's the answer yeah. I gave. And I, uh, flight had moved out of London by that time, uh, to Sutton in Surrey. So I moved back into London, into a wonderful part of London, Covent Garden. I was extremely fortunate because Tim Parker and Tony Boval, the managing director, gave me carte blanche, total creative freedom. And I was still in my early 20s, and I made a couple of decisions very early on. I decided to go for the biggest market, uh, North America. So much to the dismay of the UK sales department, the first title I commissioned was on the Reno Air Races. Mm -hmm. I had something, a, a subject matter that's always fascinated me. And I got Nigel Moll, who I'd worked with at flight, there's a theme developing here. Uh, uh, I'd worked with Nigel on Fly, and he was now working for Flying Magazine in uh, One Park Avenue, New York. And um, so he, I, we talked it up on the phone. Uh, he did an absolutely brilliant job. In fact, it won two awards, uh, the Aviation Writers Association. I think that's what they were called. I'm not sure it's, they're still with us. But it, it won a journalism award. It won a photojournalism award. And the package I inherited from Tim Parker. He'd done a 128-page kind of square format colour series book called American Trucks. And that's what I used um, with Tim Parker's encouragement for what became known as Reno Air Racing Unlimited. And just to show you some of the process that you go through, I, it, the working title was Reno Unlimited Air Racing. Uh, and I was never happy with that. So we were getting down to the wire on freezing the front cover. And um, I called Nigel. Uh, in New York and uh, he said first of all I've got some very bad news for you because we were going to do a tie-in because flying was uh, then as now probably the biggest aviation magazine in the world biggest circulation by far so I was going to do a tie-in with Nigel uh, a big splash in uh, flying magazine um, and he said Dick Dick's, Dick Collins Dick's not going for it so I thought oh my goodness me or worse to that effect uh, I'm not going to get this tie-in. You know, that's a big part of my marketing strategy for the book has just gone up in smoke. Uh, so I, to try and recover the situation, I kind of said, well, we're now about to, you know, green light the front cover, but I'm still not happy about the title. And it was his idea to flip Unlimited round, so it became Reno Air Racing Unlimited, and it just worked straight off the bat. Dago Red is on the front cover. You can still get all of these books, by the way, from the usual suspects. And... Um, and that was the only book that I actually designed. I did all the layouts myself. I actually subcontracted it to Grub Street. Uh, Mr. Davis, who's still going, John Davis, who's still going strong with, you know, Lightning Boys, Shackleton Boys, second Shackleton Boys is coming out soon. So, um, so I did it in, in his office in um, Soho. And we got the first order through from uh, uh, motor books in Osceola, Wisconsin. I think it was for 200 copies. Bearing in mind, we printed about seven and a half thousand on the first run. Mm. And uh, Tony Bovel came into my office. He didn't knock. And he said, uh, are you absolutely sure you know what you're doing, Dennis? And I kind of said, well, yes. I just, I didn't tell him about the tying going down the tubes or anything like that. I just said, yeah, it'll be, it'll be fine, it'll be okay. And then the next order came in, which was something like 500 copies. And the next order was for 2,000 copies. And it just, mm. it just went. So, phew, I had got a smash hit on my first ever book, mm -hmm. uh, first commission. Uh, um, uh, and of course, after that, it was just plain sailing. And uh, uh, whenever I had an idea for a book, I usually started with a title and then I'd find, I'd, I'd think of a name to execute it. 
uh, the, 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 the uh, editorial meetings would be me sticking my head around the door saying, hey, Tim, I've got this idea to do blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, yada, yada, yada. And you just say, yeah, just do it. That was the full extent mm -hmm. of the editorial meetings that we used to have. So what joy. Uh, and it left me more time to go to the pub, um, which uh, is, is good time well spent, I think, because I did some of my best ever creative work in the pub. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where a lot of new titles were thought up yeah. and, and subtitles were thought up. Um, essential research mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you need refreshment don't you? Brilliant yeah well obviously our viewers can find all your past work but let's talk about your current uh, work you've just released a book can you tell us about this? Yes I use uh, a pseudonym um, uh, at the behest of um, uh, uh, a blonde um, uh, and uh, I went on Twitter and on Facebook and um, the blonde is Claire Scott, and she said, "You're going to need you're going to need some visibility." And uh, and uh, I'm not sure whether it was her idea or mine that to come up with some mid-Atlantic name that was more in keeping with a thriller writer than Dennis Baldry. Nothing wrong with Dennis Baldry, uh, but I wanted to leave that in my former editorial life uh, and start my new because I don't do aviation publishing. I haven't done it for many, many, many years. So I wanted to leave that, rest on my laurels, if you like, whatever laurels they may be, uh, and start a new chapter, cliche, start a new chapter uh, uh, as a thriller writer. And um, so I thought up Dan Vandenberg. I thought Dan was a good, strong first name. Vandenberg appealed to me the way it, the, the syntax of it and the way it, it, it scanned. And, and someone I'm uh, rather fond of, said you're typically stupid you know when people go into uh, the bookshop you're going to be right over in the right in the right hand corner you know v for vandenberg <laughs> uh, and my riposte to that was you don't have to worry i'm going to be so big it doesn't matter where i am on the bookshelf uh, people will buy dan vandenberg's works so it's called blue diver and I called it Blue Diver partly because our first ever atomic weapon was Blue Danube and then we had Blue Steel and radars like uh, Blue Vixen, uh, Blue Parrot. I think it was Blue Parrot. Uh, so Blue, Blue, Blue. And I thought that was a good, that's a good name for a, for a weapon, for a secret weapon. So uh, it's set in 1983. The lead character is uh, 34 years old, uh, very pretty, uh, called Sophie Zaborski. Not based on anyone I know at all. He lied. Um, and the real quote unquote Sophie Zaborski has read, read the final draft and she's pleased with it. So if she's pleased with it, that's all I really need. Uh, everything here on in is a bonus. But uh, yeah, so that's, um, that's Blue Diver. And uh, that's why I had that identity or and have that identity on social media because uh, to be honest, I didn't really think I'd get that many followers. Uh, but I find it, uh, I tweet on aeroplanes most of the time. Mm -hmm. And I just like to add little vignettes. And uh, I have a rule uh, which is no politics. Uh, well, there's enough of that to, to be getting on with without me uh, putting my two penneth in. And I, I never get involved in uh, arguments about facts. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll just make my tweet and uh, if it, if people like it, fine. If people don't, then that's also fine. I'm not going to enter into a debate about anything. Um, yeah, but they're not meant to be super serious. They're meant to be factually accurate. Mm -hmm. But I like to give little sort of uh, little vignettes mm -hmm. uh, based on the knowledge that I've uh, somehow managed to retain <laughs> over the years. So where can we find this book? Is it in hardback, paperback? Or uh, it, it it's, it's, a, it's a Kindle download from Amazon and it's a, a paperback, print on demand paperback from Lulu. Mm -hmm. uh, no relation to the famous Scottish singer, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can, uh, it's $5.99 as a paperback, $2.99 as, as a download. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what can you get for $2.99 these exactly, days? Exactly, there you go. And uh, come, what's your Twitter handle so our followers can um, maybe follow you? It's um, Dan Vandenberg One. Vandenberg One. Dan Vandenberg One, because much to my dismay, yes, I, I discovered there was another Dan <laughs> Vandenberg. <laughs> Dash, <fun>. darn it. <laughs> but we're about to go flying in, as we uh, like yeah. will see, the Chickmonk. So can you tell us briefly what it's like to fly? Everyone will say this. Uh, everyone from uh, Air 
Chief uh, March of the Royal Air Force downwards who's ever flown a chipmunk. It is an absolute sweetheart. And uh, you can't help falling in love with it. And, uh, and I did my first trip as an air cadet, not very far from here at Coningsby, on a summer camp in August 1971. That was WG321. Uh, this is WB697. I think this was made in either, I think it was made in 51 at Chester. Most of the ones were made at Chester. Um, and um, yeah, uh, what's not to like? It's got a sliding hood or canopy. So all proper aeroplanes <laughs> have got a sliding hood. Uh, none of this door business and it's got a tail wheel so that you know ups, obviously a proper airplane has to have a tail wheel um, it's got a gypsy major engine what more do you want and um, the reason it's called the t mark 10 of course is because that's a gypsy major mark 10 right. so it became the t mark 10 mm -hmm. and um, yeah i've flown a few different ones and um, yeah it's just just a total sweetheart aeroplane. It's easy to fly, it's not difficult to fly, but rather like the Tiger Moth, if you fly it well, the instructor can tell the difference. <laughs> yeah. So it's a really brilliant trainer mm -hmm. and it inspires confidence, which is what you need if you're going through the system uh, as an aspiring fast jet pilot. You need to build a bit of confidence. And um, the story of how I first flew the Chipmunk briefly is I'd done, uh, I'd just done my tailwheel conversion at Clacton on the Super Cup and um, at that time I was living uh, back in Dromfield and I, I, and I hadn't seen the, the, the sadly now closed Sheffield City Airport which was open for exactly 10 years between 1997 and 2007 and before they closed it um, I noticed there was a chipmunk parked outside and I thought I've always wanted to fly a chipmunk again because yeah, I did have a bit of a waggle time as an air cadet, especially from places like RAF Newton. If I ever uh, win the lottery, I'd, I'd reopen Newton and buy <laughs> three or four chipmunks and get all my chums to join me and just fly cadets again, or fly anyone for that matter. Um, and there it was, and it was still in its RAF markings, um, and that one is now in Switzerland. Uh, it's been rebuilt, had a bit of a ding. Um, uh, not while I was in command, I hasten to add. Um, and um, so I walked through the door, you know, as you do. You, you walk through the door and, and I saw Kevin Rowell, who runs uh, advanced flight training, AFT, at Sherburn. Um, and it was his chipmunk. And standing next to him was Mike Rowe, who is the real Top Gun. He was Top Gun two years running mm -hmm. on 19 Squadron, which, as you know, is the first squadron, was the first squadron to have the Spitfire. Uh, in service, so a very prestigious uh, and famous squadron, and he was Top Gun two years running. So he is the he is the man, mm -hmm. and he was still instructing um, at RAF Church Fenton, and he was doing trips for Kevin in the Chipmunk, and I walked in and said, "Are you doing conversions on the Chipmunk?" And Kevin looked at Mike, and Mike looked at Kevin. Are, are we are we doing conversions on the chipmunk? <laughs> and, and and they could, you know, all perfectly fine. So um, sometimes you click with an aeroplane, sometimes you click with an instructor, sometimes you click with both. And this was one of those times when I just clicked with both. I can't tell you what a absolute ball it was flying with Mike, mm -hmm. very old school instructor. He put me on my metal, but I did the five hour conversion or convex as the uh, Air Force call it which included going to do some circuits and bumps at uh, RAF Church Fenton, which was lovely. And then the time came when he uh, uh, said, I'm getting out and uh, off you go. And being old school, before he slid the hood forward, after he tidied up the straps back there, before he slid the hood forward, he said, remember the magic phrase, Dennis, DFU. And then he closed the hood. And it was a Simpson sky, Simpson sky, perfect sky, perfect day, taxied out. Obviously, I knew eyes were watching, so I was on my best behaviour. Lined up, took off, did a left-hand turnout, looked at that roundel on the left wing, and I'm not saying I burst into tears or anything like that, but it, it was a moment. Yeah. It was a big, big moment, possibly the biggest moment I've had in my very modest flying career. Uh, th that meant so much. And, um, and I fluked a nice landing at the end of it, uh, taxied back in, 
and that's how I started flying the chipmunk. So I've been flying the chipmunk now since 2005. I'm still trying to get it right. Uh, 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 and yeah, I've flown, I've not flown a super monk and I've not flown the Canadian version. And I certainly haven't flown the crop spraying conversion, uh, but I've flown a few different ones and uh, they all fly the same delightfully. And, but this one is, as I mentioned earlier, this is the most original. So I think you're in for a bit of a treat. Absolutely. Well, um, uh, our viewers are going to see uh, uh, some footage now as we go up. So yep. thank you very much for sharing a bit of your story, Dennis. Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure. Snuggle in like it's your favourite MG. <laughs> Yeah, just snug along down there. Not very graceful. <laughs> <laughs> but effective. Effective, yeah. What are you doing? See, we don't get you talking at the time of the stops. Just pass those over for you. And you need to watch that. And somewhere lurking down there is the box with the anti submarine pad on it. Yeah, that was introduced to stop the cadets from slipping underneath the harness. Okay. So, this is, we always do the last step up first, so, we, so you're not getting tangled. Okay. In fact, let's, uh, let's, let's plug you in. Plug me in. Let's get to, we've got a little, this is the legacy of its, of its RAF service, just single socket. Any direction. Yeah, just leave it there. Okay, right. Just so you get some nice breeze. Right, yeah. And then I'll ask you to 